today I'm going over the section in chapter two called the function of the miracle worker. So the first paragraph is telling us that before miracle workers are ready to undertake their function in this world, it is essential that they fully understand the fear of release, meaning that we are terrified of releasing our ego thought system. It says otherwise they may unwittingly foster the belief that release is imprisonment, a belief that is already very prevalent. <laughs> That's a fancy way of saying that we are afraid of releasing the ego thought system, that we think releasing the ego thought system is imprisonment. It means that we are giving up our independence. We are giving up our free will is what we think. That's why we're so afraid of it. It says none of these errors is meaningful because the miscreations of the mind do not really exist. <laughs> This recognition is a far better protective device than any form of level confusion because it introduces correction at the level of error. All right, so the level of error is at the level of the mind. And it's saying that none of the errors that we make in this world at the level of ego is even meaningful. They have zero meaning whatsoever. It says because miscreations of the mind do not really exist. You're not really here. I'm not really here. The world is not really here. We do not really exist. It is essential to remember that only the mind can create and that correction belongs at the thought level. All right, so bodies can't create, egos cannot create. Only at the thought level of the mind can we create. It says spirit is already perfect and therefore does not require correction. The body does not exist except as a learning device for the mind. Again, we're not here. Bodies aren't here. It's just a temporary tool to help us wake up, to help us remember the truth that we are not our body, we are not our ego, and that we are spirit. It is obvious then that inducing the mind to give up its miscreations is the only application of creative ability that is truly meaningful. <laughs> So that's another way of saying, it's, it starts off by saying, it's obvious, okay? It is obvious. It's saying that it's obvious that our only creative ability in this world is to give up our miscreations. That's it. That's the only thing that we can really create <laughs> is giving up our miscreations. All right, paragraph two is telling us that magic is mindless or the miscreative use of mind. So it's saying that physical medicines are forms of spells. But if you are afraid to use the mind to heal, you should not attempt to do so. Okay, so the rest of this paragraph is basically telling us that only our mind can heal, that no illnesses within the body actually really exist. However, we are terrified of that truth. We are terrified of knowing that we are not here and that our bodies are not real and that magic, um, for example, something like medicine, isn't real. It says the very fact that you are afraid makes your mind vulnerable to miscreation. So when we're in a state of fear, we automatically start miscreating. We can't help it. It's our unconscious reaction to fear is to miscreate within our dream world using our ego thought system. So it's telling us that when we're in that state of fear, we can't help it, we're just gonna end up miscreating. So it says you are therefore likely to misunderstand any healing that might occur. And because egocentricity and fear usually occur together, you may be unable to accept the real source of the healing. So it's just explaining to us how we're afraid to heal. We're afraid to heal our split mind. We are afraid to give up our ego thought system. And therefore, we would see healing coming from source, coming from pure spirit as a threat when our mind is in that place. So it says, under these conditions, it is safer for you to rely temporarily on physical healing devices because you cannot misperceive them as your own creations. All right, so when we're in a state of fear, which we all are when we appear to be here, which we all are when we believe in this world, 
So when we are afraid of healing, which we are any time that we believe in our ego and we believe in this world, we would start misperceiving things. We would not understand love and healing and truth when it comes to us because we are internally, unconsciously terrified of it. So this is all just a fancy way of saying that it's okay to believe in magic temporarily while you think you're here. It's okay to use things like medicine or anything else within this illusory physical world that temporarily helps you to feel better. It's telling us it's okay to do that, even though another part of our mind is learning right now that it's not real. Paragraph three is telling us that the miracle need not await the right-mindedness of the receiver. In fact, its purpose is to restore him to his right mind. It is essential, however, that the miracle worker be in his right mind, however briefly, or he will be unable to reestablish right-mindedness in someone else. Okay, so this paragraph is explaining to us about practicing forgiveness, okay? So in order to practice forgiveness, we, the practicer, the giver of forgiveness, need to be in our right mind, even if it's temporary, even if it's just for a brief, holy instant moment, it's okay. So in that moment when we are in our right mind and we can see another clearly with our right mind, knowing that we are just pure spirit, pure love, God source creation, and so are they. All right. It's telling us that it's okay if the receiver, the other person that we are seeing as pure spirit, isn't able to receive that message. It's saying it's okay. All that's necessary is that you, the giver of forgiveness, the giver of the miracle, knows the truth. It's okay that if the receiver does not know the truth because all minds are joined. That's why it says that the miracle worker must be in his right mind because we have to see correctly in order to forgive. However, briefly, meaning even if it's only for a holy instant, or he will be unable to reestablish right mindedness in someone else. Why do we need to reestablish right mindedness? Because it's already established. It's already there. It's already our truth. We just need to reestablish it within our one mind. Because remember, all minds are joined. We're all connected. There's only one of us. There's nobody out there. <laughs> Science has already proven all of this. Take a look at quantum physics. It's all there right in front of us. There's nothing here. The world is an illusion. There's nobody out there. So the only purpose of this temporary dream world is for us to remember the truth. All right, the fourth paragraph is telling us the healer who relies on his own readiness is endangering his understanding. Okay, so if we're relying on ourselves and not on Holy Spirit or Jesus, whatever you want to think of it as, the divine, God source creation, whatever makes you feel most comfortable, but it's basically a representation of the truth of spirit. So it, when, we need to rely on that. We need to rely on our higher self meaning Holy Spirit, Jesus, the divine, whatever you want to call it. Because if we rely on just ourselves, we are endangering our understanding, okay? Because we don't get it. <laughs> Only our right mind gets it. Only the Jesus part of our mind, our Christ consciousness, that's the part that gets it. It says you are perfectly safe as long as you are completely unconcerned about your readiness, but maintain a constant trust in mind meaning Jesus, meaning our Christ consciousness. That's the part of our mind that we need to trust. It says, if your miracle working inclinations are not functioning properly, it is always because fear has intruded on your right mindedness and has turned it upside down. All forms of not right mindedness are the result of refusal to accept atonement for yourself. Okay. <laughs> So all those words simply mean that we are terrified to release the ego thought system. We are terrified to do this. And if left to our own devices, we will not do it. So we need to stop trusting in ourselves, stop trusting in the ego thought system, and only trust in our right mind, our Christ consciousness mind. And if we don't feel comfortable claiming that for ourselves yet and understanding that that's who we really are, we continuously can use Jesus or Holy Spirit as the middleman to help us, to help us understand. This is who we need to give our trust to. 
And remember, that's just another part of yourself. There's only one of us. We are Jesus. We are spirit. So it tells us here that the ego turns everything upside down and that all forms of not right mindedness, which is just ego thought, the ego thought system, is a result of a refusal to accept the atonement, which is just the undoing of the ego thought system. Okay, I keep telling you, this book, it's so simple. It's saying the same things over and over and over again. We are not bodies. We are not here. We are not egos. Our ego thought system is mistaken. We have miscreated. We are not really here. The reason we keep believing we're here and thinking we're here is because we are terrified of who and what we really are. <laughs> so we just keep running. We just keep procrastinating. We just keep projecting in order to not face the truth. That is what it is telling us. And it's telling us in the very last line that right-mindedness is healing. This is how we heal our split mind. Paragraph five says, in italics, the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. That's it, that's all we're here to do, is to know that we're not here and to accept the atonement, which is understanding who and what we really are, which is just spirit, which is pure love. By denying your mind any destructive potential and reinstating its purely constructive powers, you place yourself in a position to undo the level confusion of others. Okay, those are just fancy words to talk about what happens when we forgive. Okay, when we practice forgiveness and we know that we are spirit and everyone and everything out there is just spirit, we are reinstating our right-mindedness. That's what we're doing. That's our purpose here. It says the message you then give to them, meaning the person or people you are forgiving, is the truth that their minds are similarly constructive and their miscreations cannot hurt them. That just means that we cannot create in this world and nothing we think that we're creating, which are really just miscreating, we're just making in this world can hurt us. And that the message of forgiveness is giving them the truth that our minds are creators of God that we are spirit coming from source and that that is our true identity. Paragraph six is telling us, it should be emphasized again that the body does not learn any more than it creates. Okay, it's telling us again, the body's nothing. <laughs> it's not even really here. It's just a temporary tool to understand who and what we really are, which is spirit. It says as a learning device, it merely follows the learner. Okay, so as a learning device, the body is just following the mind. That's the learner, is our mind, not our bodies. It says, but if it is falsely endowed with self-initiative, it becomes a serious obstruction to the very learning it should facilitate. So what that means is if we take our bodies seriously and we think we're really bodies and we think we're really here, that is an obstruction to learning. That's how we obstruct our learning. <laughs> It's, it says it becomes a serious obstruction to the very learning it should facilitate. So we're supposed to be using these bodies to know we're not here. And when we do the opposite, which is what most of us are doing all the time, we are obstructing our learning. We are obstructing our awakening. And then it says the body is, however, easily brought into alignment with a mind that has learned to look beyond it toward the light. Okay, more words that are just talking about forgiveness that when we see others with our right mind, seeing them correctly as just spirit, that is how we heal. That is how we come into alignment. All right, paragraph seven says, corrective learning always begins with awakening of spirit and the turning away from the belief in physical sight. All right, another way to say, overlook the body, the body isn't real, overlook the world of form, to see spirit, to use your spiritual sight. That is how we learn. That's corrective learning. It says this often entails fear because you are afraid of what your spiritual sight will show you. All right, we're terrified. We're terrified to find out that we aren't bodies. We are terrified to find out that the ego isn't real and that our entire thought system of this world isn't real. We are terrified of that. That's why we don't want to use our spiritual sight, because we don't want to know that. Our egos don't want to know that. It says, I said before that the Holy Spirit cannot see error and is capable of only looking beyond it 
to the defense of the atonement. That's just a fancy way of saying that spirit can only see truth. Spirit only sees spirit. There is no doubt that this may produce discomfort, okay? (laughs) We are uncomfortable with that, with knowing that we're spirit and using our spiritual sight to know that. It produces discomfort. It says, yet the discomfort is not the final outcome of the perception. It tells us later that nothing he perceives can induce fear. Everything that results from spiritual awareness is merely channelized (laughs) toward correction. Discomfort is aroused only to bring the need for correction into awareness. So that's the purpose of the discomfort. The purpose of the discomfort that we feel here within our dream is there to get us to want a better way, to seek a different way, to want to use our spiritual sight to escape the discomfort that we keep feeling within our illusory dream world. That's the whole purpose. Paragraph eight is telling us the fear of healing arises in the end from an unwillingness to accept unequivocally that healing is necessary. (laughs) Okay, so we don't even want to know that we're broken. We don't even want to know that healing is necessary. This is our egos, okay? Our egos don't want to know any of this. Uh Uh-uh. They want to think, nope, nope, this world is great. I'm in charge. I'm the boss. I can make anything. I can create anything I want in this world. You know, the world is my oyster. We want to think that. And we have many, many things within our illusory world to support uh, that line of thinking. It says, as long as you believe in what your physical sight tells you, your attempt at correction will be misdirected. (laughs) So it's telling us anytime we're trying to use our physical sight, the physical world, our physical bodies to learn something, we're going to fail every single time. We've been misdirected. We cannot heal there. It says the real vision is obscured because you cannot endure to see your own defiled altar. All right, this is when all the guilt starts to be recognized. And this is why we're terrified. This is why we're always running away. We do not want to face our guilt. And we have so much unconscious guilt that we couldn't even begin to wrap our minds around it. How much guilt that we feel because we think that we destroyed God and heaven. We think we did that. And we think that God is coming to get us. And this is all deeply, deeply unconscious. We have tremendous, tremendous unconscious guilt. So that is what it's talking about with the defiled altar. We are terrified to know that we have a defiled altar, the altar of God that is within us. Paragraph nine is telling us that healing is an ability that developed after the separation before which it was unnecessary (laughs) because when we weren't separated and we were whole with God in heaven, there was no need for healing. There was nothing to be healed. And there was certainly no belief in separation. Like all aspects of the belief in space and time, it is temporary. Okay, this dream world of space and time is temporary. However, as long as time persists, healing is needed as a means of protection. This is because healing rests on charity, and charity is a way of perceiving the perfection of another, even if you cannot perceive it in yourself. Okay, so space and time is temporary. This whole illusory dream is just a tool for us to wake up. And then it starts to use this word charity. It's going to go on for the rest of the paragraph to talk all about charity. And it's simply using another word to refer to forgiveness. The way it's describing charity here uh, about perceiving it in another is just about practicing forgiveness, seeing another as pure spirit. That's how we practice forgiveness. So that's why it says charity is really a weaker reflection of a much more powerful love encompassment that is far beyond any form of charity you can conceive of as yet. Meaning forgiveness. It meaning that when we practice forgiveness here, it's minuscule compared to what we will feel when we are in revelation, when we are in communion with God, when we are whole back at home with God in heaven, extending love eternally. What we feel when we are practicing forgiveness is just a tiny, tiny little glimpse of that. We cannot conceive yet 
the totality of the love, the totality of the unconditional love that we truly are and truly feel. All right, last paragraph says, I said before that only revelation transcends time. The miracle as an expression of charity can only shorten it. Okay, again, it's just talking about practicing forgiveness, the miracle. It's a tool to shorten the temporary illusion of space and time. It must be understood, however, that whenever you offer a miracle to another, meaning practicing forgiveness, you are shortening the suffering of both of you. This corrects retroactively as well as progressively. All right, so what that means is that when we practice forgiveness, which means using your spiritual sight to overlook bodies, to overlook things of this illusory world, to see that everyone and everything is just spirit, just pure love, Knowing that is practicing forgiveness in that moment, in that holy instant, you know who you are and you know who the other is or others. And when that happens, because all minds are joined, we are helping one another to align with our right mindedness. We are helping one another to remember who and what we really are. And so when we do this, when we practice forgiveness, when we use these miracles, we are shortening the suffering of both us and others because we are collapsing time when we are doing that. And it says this corrects retroactively as well as progressively, meaning it heals and forgives both the past and the future because the past and the future aren't even real. They don't even exist. And there is no such thing as time. There's only the now moment. So when we forgive in the now moment, we are collapsing time and that forgiveness pertains to all time, which is just the now moment, which is why it's also healing the past and the future. Okay. <laughs> so if all of that seems confusing or overwhelming, don't worry about it. At the end of the day, the course is very simple. You are not here. We are not here. This world is a dream. It is a temporary learning aid. It's a tool to help us remember to wake up to the truth of who and what we really are which is just love, which is just spirit. So the more we practice forgiveness, which is what the miracle is, overlooking all form to only see spirit, this is our one and only function. This is the function of the miracle worker.